Section two, book the second of the Iliad of Homer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Stephen Carney. The Iliad of Homer by Homer. Translated by Theodore Alois Buckley. Section two, book the second. Argument. Jove sends a dream to Agamemnon, in consequence of which he reassembles the army. Thersites is punished for his insolent speech, and the troops are restrained from seeking a return homewards. The catalogue of the ships and the forces of the confederates follows. The rest, then, both gods and horse-arraying men, slept all the night, but Jove sweet sleep possessed not. But he was pondering in his mind how he might honour Achilles, and destroy many at the ships of the Greeks. But this device appeared best to him in his mind, to send a fatal dream to Agamemnon, the son of Atreus. And addressing him, he spoke winged words, Haste away, pernicious dream, to the swift ships of the Greeks. Going into the tent of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, utter very accurately everything as I shall command thee, Bid him arm the long-haired Achaeans with all their array, for now perhaps he may take the wide-wayed city of the Trojans, for the immortals who possess the Olympian mansions no longer think dividedly, for Juno, supplicating, hath bent all to her will, and woes are impending over the Trojans. Thus he spake, and the dream accordingly departed, as soon as it heard the mandate, and quickly it came to the swift ships of the Greeks, and went unto Agamemnon, the son of Atreus. But him it found sleeping in his tent, and ambrosial slumber was diffused around. And he stood over his head like unto Nestor, the son of Neleus, him to wit, whom Agamemnon honoured most of the old men. To him assimilating himself, the divine dream addressed him. Sleepest thou, son of the warrior, horse-taming Atreus? It becomes not a counsel-giving man to whom the people have been entrusted, and to whom so many things are a care, to sleep all night. But now quickly attend to me, for I am a messenger to thee from Jove, who, although far distant, greatly regards and pities thee. He orders thee to arm the long-haired Greeks with all their array, for now mayest thou take the wide-wayed city of the Trojans, since the immortals who possess the Olympian mansions no longer think dividedly. For Juno, supplicating, hath bent all to her will, and woes from Jove are impending over the Trojans. But do thou preserve this in thy recollection, nor let forgetfulness possess thee, when sweet sleep shall desert thee. Thus then having spoken, he departed, and left him there pondering these things in his mind, which were not destined to be accomplished. For he, foolish, thought that he would take the city of Priam on that day, nor knew he the deeds which Jupiter was really devising, for even he was about yet to impose additional hardships and sorrows upon both Trojans and Greeks, through mighty conflicts. But he awoke from his sleep, and the heavenly voice was diffused around him, he sat up erect, and put on his soft tunic, beautiful, new, and around him he threw his large cloak, and he bound his beautiful sandals on his shining feet, and slung from his shoulders a silver-studded sword. He also took his paternal scepter, ever imperishable, with which he went to the ships of the brazen-mailed Greeks. The goddess Aurora now ascended wide Olympus, announcing the dawn to Jove and the other immortals, but he on his part ordered the clear-voiced heralds to summon the long-haired Achaeans to an assembly. They therefore summoned them, and the people were very speedily assembled. First the assembly of the magnanimous elders sat at the ship of Nestor, the pilous born king. Having called them together, he propounded a prudent counsel. Hear me, my friends. A divine dream came to me in sleep during the ambrosial night very like unto the noble Nestor, in form, in stature, and in mien. And it stood above my head, and addressed me, Sleepest thou, son of the warrior, horse-taming Atreus? It becomes not a counsellor, to whom the people have been entrusted, 
and to whom so many things are a care to sleep all night but now quickly attend to me for i am a messenger to thee from jove who although far distant greatly regards and pities thee he orders thee to arm the long-haired greeks with all their array for now mayest thou take the wide-wayed city of the trojans for the immortals who possess the olympian mansions no longer think dividedly for juno supplicating has bent all to her will and woes from jove are impending over the trojans but do thou preserve this in thy thoughts thus having spoken flying away it departed but sweet sleep resigned me but come let us try if by any means we can arm the sons of the greeks but first with words will i sound their inclinations as is right and i will command them to fly with their many benched ships but do you restrain them with words one in one place another in another he indeed having thus spoken sat down but nestor who was king of the sandy pilus rose up who wisely counselling harangued them and said o friends generals and counsellors of the argives if any other of the greeks had told this dream we should have pronounced it a fabrication and withdrawn ourselves from the reciter but now he has seen it who boasts himself to be by far the greatest man in the army but come on if by any means we can arm the sons of the greeks thus then having spoken he began to depart from the assembly and they the sceptre-bearing princes arose and obeyed the shepherd of the tribes and the hosts rushed forward even as the swarms of clustering bees issuing ever anew from the hollow rock go forth and fly in troops over the vernal flowers and some having flitted in bodies here and some there thus of these greeks many nations from the ship and tents kept marching in troops in front of the steep shore to the assembly and in the midst of them blazed rumour messenger of jove urging them to proceed and they kept collecting together the assembly was tumultuous and the earth groaned beneath as the people seated themselves and there was a clamour but nine heralds vociferating restrained themselves if by any means they would cease from clamour and hear the jove nurtured princes with difficulty at length the people sat down and were kept to their respective seats having desisted from their clamour when king agamemnon arose holding the sceptre which vulcan had laboriously wrought vulcan in the first place gave it to king jove the son of saturn and jove in turn gave it to his messenger the slayer of argus but king mercury gave it to steed taming pelops and pelops again gave it to atreus shepherd of the people but atreus dying left it to thyestes rich in flocks but thyestes again left it to agamemnon to be born that he might rule over many islands and all argos leaning upon this he spoke words amongst the greeks o friends grecian heroes servants of mars jove the son of saturn has entangled me in a heavy misfortune cruel who before indeed promised to me and vouchsafed by his nod that i should return home having destroyed well fortified ilium but now he has devised an evil deception and commands me to return to argos inglorious after i have lost many of my people so forsooth it appears to be agreeable to all-powerful jove who has already overthrown the citadels of many cities yea and will even yet overthrow them for transcendent is his power for this were disgraceful even for posterity to hear that so brave and so numerous a people of the greeks warred an ineffectual war and fought with fewer men but as yet no end has appeared for if we greeks and trojans having struck a faithful league wished that both should be numbered and wished to select the trojans on the one hand as many as our townsmen and if we greeks on the other hand were to be divided into decades and to choose a single man of the trojans to pour out wine for each decade many decades would be without a cup-bearer so much more numerous i say the sons of the greeks are than the trojans who dwell in the city but there are spear-wielding auxiliaries from many cities who greatly stand in my way and do not permit me wishing to destroy the well-inhabited city already have nine years of mighty jove passed away and now the timbers of our ships 
have rotted and the ropes have become untwisted our wives and infant children sit in our dwellings expecting us but to us the work for which we came hither remains unaccomplished contrary to expectation but come as i shall recommend let us all obey let us fly with the ships to our dear native land for at no future time shall we take wide wayed troy thus he spoke and to them he aroused the heart in their breasts to all throughout the multitude whoever had not heard his scheme and the assembly was moved as the great waves of the acarian sea which indeed both the southeast wind and the south are wont to raise rushing from the clouds of father jove and as when the west wind agitates the thick standing corn rushing down upon it impetuous and it the crop bends with its ears so was all the assembly agitated some with shouting rushed to the ships but from beneath their feet the dust stood suspended aloft and some exhorted one another to seize the vessels and drag them to the great ocean and they began to clear the channels the shout of them eager to return home rose to the sky and they withdrew the stays from beneath the vessels then truly a return had happened to the argives contrary to destiny had not juno addressed herself to minerva alas indomitable daughter of aegis bearing jove thus now shall the argives fly home to their dear native land over the broad back of the deep and leave to priam glory and to the trojans argive helen on whose account many greeks have perished at troy far from their dear native land but go now to the people of the brazen mailed greeks and restrain each man with thy own flattering words nor suffer them to launch to the sea their evenly plied barks thus she spoke nor did the azure-eyed goddess minerva refuse compliance but she hastening descended down from the summits of olympus and quickly reached the swift ships of the achaeans then she found a ulysses of equal weight with jove and council standing still nor was he touching his well-benched sable bark since regret affected him in his heart and mind but standing near him azure-eyed minerva said jove sprung son of laertes ulysses of many wiles thus then will ye fly home to your dear native land embarking in your many benched ships and will ye then leave to priam glory and to the trojans argive helen on whose accounts many greek have fallen at troy far from their dear native land but go now to the people of the greeks delay not and restrain each man by thine own flattering words nor suffer them to launch to the sea their evenly plied barks thus she spoke but he knew the voice of the goddess speaking then he hastened to run and cast away his cloak but the herald eurybates the ithacensian who followed him took it up but he meeting agamemnon son of atreus received from him the ever imperishable paternal sceptre with which he went through the ships of the brazen mailed greeks whatsoever king indeed or distinguished man he chanced to find standing beside him he checked him with gentle words strange man it ill becomes thee coward-like to be in trepidation but both sit down myself and make the other people sit down for thou hast not as yet clearly ascertained what the intention of atreides is he is now making trial of and will quickly punish the sons of the greeks we have not all heard what he said in council take care lest he being incensed do some mischief to the sons of the greeks for the anger of a jove nurtured king is great his honour too is from jove and great counselling jove loves him but on the other hand whatever man of the common people he chanced to see or find shouting out him would he strike with the sceptre and reprove with words fellow sit quietly and listen to the voice of others who are better than thou for thou art unwarlike and weak nor ever of any account either in war or in council we greeks cannot all by any means govern here for a government of many is not a good thing let there be but one chief one king to whom the son of wily saturn has given a sceptre and laws that he may govern among them thus he acting as chief was arranging the army but they again rushed with tumult from the ships and tents to an assembly as when the waves of the much resounding sea roar against the lofty beach and the deep resounds the others indeed sat down and were kept to their respective seats but thersites alone immediate in words 
was wrangling who to wit knew in his mind expressions both unseemly and numerous so as idly and not according to discipline to wrangle with the princes but to blurt out whatever seemed to him to be matter of laughter to the greeks and he was the ugliest man who came to ilium he was bandy-legged and lame of one foot his shoulders were crooked and contracted towards his breast and his head was peaked towards the top and thin woolly hair was scattered over it to achilles and ulysses he was particularly hostile for these two he used to revile but on this occasion shouting out shrilly he uttered bitter taunts against noble agamemnon but the greeks were greatly irritated against him and were indignant in their minds but vociferating aloud he reviled agamemnon with words son of atreus of what dost thou now complain of what dost thou want thy tents are full of brass and many chosen women are in thy tents whom we greeks bestow on thee the first of all whenever we capture a city dost thou still require gold which some one of the horse-taming trojans shall bring from troy as a ransom for his son whom i or some other of the greeks having bound may lead away or a young maid that thou mayest be mingled in dalliance and whom thou for thyself mayest retain apart from the rest indeed it becomes not a man who is chief in command to lead the sons of the greeks into evil o ye soft ones vile disgraces grecian dames no longer grecian men let us return home home with our ships and let us leave him here to digest his honours at troy that he may know whether we really aid him in anything or not he who but just now has dishonoured achilles a man much more valiant than himself for taking away he retains his prize he himself having seized it but assuredly there is not much anger in the heart of achilles but he is forbearing for truly were it not so o son of atreus thou wouldst have insulted now for the last time thus spoke their cities reviling agamemnon the shepherd of the people but godlike ulysses immediately stood beside him and eyeing him with scowling brow reproached him with harsh language there cities reckless babbler noising declaimer thou though be refrain nor be forward singly to strive with princes for i affirm that there is not another mortal more base than thou as many as came with the son of atreus to ilium wherefore do not harangue having kings in thy mouth nor cast reproaches against them nor be on the watch for a return not as yet indeed do we certainly know how these matters will turn out whether we sons of the greeks shall return to our advantage or disadvantage wherefore now thou sittest reviling agamemnon son of atreus the leader of the people because the grecian heroes give him very many gifts whilst thou insulting dost harangue but i declare to thee which shall also be accomplished if ever again i catch thee raving as now thou art no longer may the head of ulysses rest upon his shoulders and no longer may i be called the father of telemachus unless i seizing thee divest thee of thy very garments thy coat thy cloak and those which cover thy loins and send thyself weeping into the swift ships having beaten thee out of the assembly with severe blows thus he spoke and smote him with the sceptre upon the back and the shoulders but he writhed and plenteous tears fell from him and a bloody wheel arose under the sceptre upon his back but he sat down and trembled and grieving looking foolish he wiped away the tears they although chagrined laughed heartily at him and thus one would say looking towards the person next to him oh strange surely ten thousand good things has ulysses already performed both originating good counsellors and arousing the war but now has he done this by far the best deed among the greeks in that he has restrained this foul mouth reviler from his harangues surely his petulant mind will not again urge him to chide the kings with scurrilous language thus spake the multitude but ulysses the sacker of cities arose holding the sceptre and beside him azure-eyed minerva likened unto a herald ordered the people to be silent that at the same time the sons of the greeks both first and last might hear his speech and weigh his counsel he wisely counselling addressed them and said 
O son of Atreus, the Greeks wish to render thee now, O king, the meanest among articulately speaking men, nor perform their promise to thee, a hundred which they held forth, coming hither from steed-nourishing Argos, that thou shouldest return home, having destroyed well-fortified Ilium. For, like tender boys or widowed men, they bewail unto one another to return home, and truly it is a hardship to return so, having been grieved. For he is impatient who is absent even for a single month from his wife, remaining with his many benched ship, though wintry storms and the boisterous sea may be hemming in, but to us it is now the ninth revolving year since we have been lingering here. Wherefore I am not indignant that the Greeks are growing impatient by their curved ships, but still it would be disgraceful both to remain here so long, and to return ineffectually. Endure, my friends, and remain yet a while, that we may know whether Calchas prophesies truly or not. For this we well know, and ye are all witnesses, whom the fates of death carried not off yesterday and the day before, when the ships of the Greeks were collected at Aulis, bearing evils to Priam and the Trojans, and we round the fountain at the sacred altars offered perfect hecatombs to the immortals beneath a beauteous plane tree whence flowed limpid water. There a great prodigy appeared, a serpent spotted on the back, horrible, which the Olympian himself had sent forth into the light, having glided out from beneath the altar, proceeded forthwith to the plane tree. And there were the young of a sparrow, on a topmost branch, cowering amongst the foliage, eight in number. But the mother, which had brought forth the young ones, was the ninth. Thereupon he devoured them, twittering piteously, while the mother kept fluttering about, lamenting her dear young. But then, having turned himself about, he seized her by the wing, screaming around. But after he had devoured the young of the sparrow and herself, the god who had displayed him rendered him very portentous, for the son of wily Saturn changed him into a stone. But we, standing by, were astonished at what happened. Thus, therefore, the dreadful portents of the gods approached the hecatombs. Calchas then immediately addressed us, revealing from the gods, why are ye become silent, ye waving crested Greeks? For us, indeed, Providence Jove has shown a great sign of late accomplishment, the renown of which shall never perish, as this serpent has devoured the young of the sparrow, eight in number, and herself, the mother which brought out the brood, was the ninth. So must we for as many years wage war here. But in the tenth we shall take the wide-wayed city." He indeed thus harangued, and all these things are now in course of accomplishment. But come, ye well-grieved Greeks, remain all here until we shall take the great city of Priam. Thus he, Ulysses, spoke, and the Greeks loudly shouted, applauding the speech of divine Ulysses. But all around the ships echoed fearfully, by reason of the Greeks shouting. Then the Gerenian knight Nestor addressed them, O strange! Assuredly now ye are talking like infant children, with whom warlike achievements are of no account. Whither then will your compacts and oaths depart? Into the fire now must the counsels and thoughts of men have sunk, and the unmixed libations and the right hands in which we trusted. For in vain do we dispute with words, nor can we discover any resource, although we have been here a long time. But do thou, O son of Atreus, maintaining as before thy purpose firm, command the Greeks in the hard-fought conflicts, and abandon those to perish, one and both, who, separated from the Greeks, are meditating, but success shall not attend them, to return back to Argos, before they know whether the promise of Aegis-bearing Jove be false or not. For I say that the powerful son of Saturn assented on that day, when the Argives embarked in their swift ships, bearing death and fate to the Trojans, flashing his lightning on the right, and showing propitious signs. Let not any one therefore hasten to return home, before each has slept with a Trojan wife, and has avenged the cares and griefs of Helen. But if any one is extravagantly eager to return home, let him lay hands upon his well-benched black ship, that he may draw on death and fate before others. 
but do thou thyself deliberate well o king and attend to another nor shall the advice which i am about to utter be discarded separate the troops agamemnon according to the tribes and clans that kindred may support kindred and clan if thou wilt thus act and the greeks obey thou wilt then ascertain which of the generals and which of the soldiers is a dastard and which of them may be brave for they will fight their best and thou wilt likewise learn whether it is by the divine interposition that thou art destined not to dismantle the city or by the cowardice of the troops and their unskilfulness in war but him answering king agamemnon addressed old man now indeed as at other times dost thou excel the sons of the greeks in council for would o father jove minerva and apollo that i were possessed of ten such fellow counsellors among the greeks so should the city of priam quickly fall captured and destroyed by our hands but upon me hath aegis bearing jove the son of saturn sent sorrow who casts me into unavailing strifes and contentions for i and achilles have quarrelled on account of a maid with opposing words but i began quarrelling but if ever we shall consult in common no longer then shall there be a respite from evil to the trojans no not for ever so short a time now go to your repast that we may join the battle but let each one well sharpen his spear and well prepare his shield let him give fodder to his swift-footed steeds and let each one looking well to his chariot get ready for war that we may contend all day in the dreadful battle nor shall there be a cessation not for ever so short a while until night coming on shall part the wrath of the heroes the belt of the man protecting shield shall be moist with sweat around the breasts of each one and he shall weary his hand round his spear and each one's horse shall sweat dragging the well-polished chariot but whomsoever i shall perceive desirous to remain at the beaked ships apart from the battle it will not be possible for him afterwards to escape the dogs and the birds thus he spoke but the argives shouted aloud as when a wave roars against the steep shore when the south wind urges it coming against an outjutting rock for this the billows from all kinds of winds never forsake when they may be here or there and rising up the people hastened forth scattered from ship to ship and raised up smoke among the tents and took repast and one sacrificed to some one of the immortal gods and another to another praying to escape death and the slaughter of war but king agamemnon offered up a fat ox of five years old to the powerful son of saturn and summoned the elder chiefs of all the greeks nestor first of all and king dominaeus but next the two ajaxes and the son of tydeus and sixth ulysses of equal weight with jove in council but menelaus valiant in the din of war came of his own accord for he knew his brother in his heart how he was oppressed then they stood around the ox and raised up the pounded barley cakes and king agamemnon praying amidst them said o joys most glorious most great dark cloud collector dwelling in the air may not the sun set nor darkness come on before i have laid prostrate priam's hall blazing and consumed its gates with the hostile fire and cut away hector's coat of mail around his breast split asunder with the brass and around him may many comrades prone in the dust seize the earth with their teeth thus he spoke nor as yet did the son of saturn assent but he accepted the offering and increased abundant toil but after they had prayed and thrown forward the bruised barley they first drew back the neck of the victim slew it and flayed it then cut out the thighs and covered them in the fat having arranged it in a double fold and then laid the raw flesh upon them and they roasted them upon leafless billets next having pierced the entrails with spits they held them over the fire but then after the thighs were roasted and they had tasted the entrails they cut the rest of them into small pieces and fixed them on the spits and roasted them skilfully and drew them all off the spits 
but when they had ceased from labor and had prepared the banquet they feasted nor did their soul in any wise lack a due allowance of the feast but when they had dismissed the desire of drink and food them the gerenian knight nestor began to address most glorious son of atreus agamemnon king of men let us now no longer sit prating here nor let us long defer the work which the deity now delivers into our hands but come let the heralds of the brazen mailed greeks summoning the people assemble them at the ships and let us thus in a body pass through the wide army of the greeks that we may the sooner awaken keen warfare thus he spoke nor did agamemnon king of men refuse compliance immediately he ordered the clear-voiced heralds to summon the waving crested greeks to battle these then gave the summons and they were hastily assembled and the jove nurtured kings who were with the son of atreus kept hurrying about arranging them but amongst them was azure-eyed minerva holding the inestimable aegis which grows not old and is immortal from which one hundred golden fringes were suspended all well woven and each worth a hundred oxen in price with this she looking fiercely about traversed the host of the greeks citing them to advance and kindled strength in the breast of each to fight and contend unceasingly thus war became instantly sweeter to them than the return in the hollow ships to their dear native land as when a destructive fire consumes an immense forest upon the tops of a mountain and the gleam is seen from afar so as they advanced the radiance from the beaming brass glittering on all sides reached heaven through the air and of these like as the numerous nations of winged fowl of geese or cranes or long-necked swans on the asian mead by the waters of caister fly on this side and on that disporting with their wings alighting beside each other clamorously and the meadow resounds so the numerous nation of these the greeks from the ships and tents poured themselves forth into the plain of scamander countless as the flowers and leaves are produced in spring as the numerous swarms of clustering flies which congregate round the shepherd's pen in the spring season when too the milk overflows the pails so numerous stood the head-crested greeks upon the plain against the trojans eager to break their lines and these as goat-herds easily separate the broad flocks of the goats when they are mingled in the pasture so did the generals here and there marshal them to go to battle and among them commander agamemnon resembling as to his eyes and head the thunder delighting jove as to his middle mars and as to his breast neptune as a bull in the herd is greatly eminent above all for he surpasses the collected cattle such on that day did jove render agamemnon distinguished amongst many and conspicuous amongst heroes tell me now ye muses who possess the olympian mansions for ye are goddesses and are ever present and ken all things whilst we hear but a rumour nor know anything who were the leaders and chiefs of the greeks for i could not recount nor tell the multitude not even if ten tongues and ten mouths were mine not though a voice unwearied and a brazen heart were within me unless the olympic muses daughters of aegis bearing jove reminded me of how many came to ilium however i will rehearse the commanders of the ships and all the ships the catalogue of the ships peneleus and Lytus and arcesilaus and prothaenor and clonius commanded the Boeotians both those who tilled hyri and rocky aulis and shurnus and sholos and hilly Eteonus, thespia grea and the ample plain of mycalesis and those who dwell about harma and elesius and erythera and those who possessed elion hyli pateon ocalea and the well-built city medion copeia utresis and thisbe abounding in doves and those who possessed coronea and grassy hilertus and plataea and those who inhabited glissa and those who dwelt in hypothabia the well-built city and in sacred onchestus the beauteous grove of neptune and those who inhabited grape-clustered arna and those who inhabited medea and divine nyssa and remote anthedon 
fifty ships of these went to Troy, and in each embarked a hundred and twenty Boeotian youths. Those who inhabited Asplodon and the Menaean or Comenus, these Ascalaphus and Ilmenus, the sons of Mars, led, whom Astyoche bore to powerful Mars in the house of Actor, son of Asis, a modest virgin, when she ascended the upper part of her father's house. But the god secretly embraced her. Of these thirty hollow ships went in order. Moreover, Scedius and Epistrophus, sons of Magnanimous Iphitus, the son of Nobulus, led the Phocaeans, who possessed Cyparissus and Rocky Python, and divine Chrysa and Daulus and Panopeia, and those who dwelt around Anemoria and Hyampolis, and near the sacred river Cephasus, and those who possessed Lilea at the sources of Cephasus. With these forty dark ships followed. They indeed, going round, arranged the lines of the Phocaeans, and they were drawn up in array near the Boeotians and towards the left wing. Swift-footed Ajax, the son of Oileus, was leader of the Locrians, less in stature than, and not so tall as Ajax, the son of Telamon, but much less. He was small indeed, wearing a linen corslet, but in the use of the spear he surpassed all the Hellenes and Achaeans who inhabited Sidus, Opus, Celiaris, Bessa, Scarpha, and the pleasant Ogia, and Tarpha, and Thronium, around the streams of Boagrius but with him forty dark ships of the Locraeans followed, who dwelled beyond the sacred Euboea. The Abantes, breathing strength, who possessed Euboea and Chalicus, and Eretria, and grape-clustered Histeia, and maritime Cerinthus, and the towering city of Deum, and those who inhabited Charistus and Styra, the leader of these was Elephenor, of the line of Mars, the son of Chalcodon, the magnanimous prince of the Abantes. With him the swift Abantes followed, with flowing locks behind, warriors skilled with pretended spears of ash, to break the corslets on the breasts of their enemies. With him forty dark ships followed. Those besides who possessed Athens, the well-built city, the state of the magnanimous Erechtheus, whom Minerva, the daughter of Jove, formerly nursed, but him the bounteous earth brought forth, and settled at Athens in her own rich temple. There the sons of the Athenians, in revolving years, appease her with sacrifices of bulls and lambs. Them Menestheus, son of Peteus, commanded. No man upon the earth was equal to him in marshalling steeds, and shielded warriors into battle. Nestor alone abide with him, for he was elder, with him fifty dark ships followed. But Ajax led twelve ships from Salamis, and leading, arranged them where the phalanxes of the Athenians were drawn up. Those who possessed Argos, and well-fortified Tyrans, Hermione, and which encircled the Asine deep bay, Troezene, and Aeonia, and vine-planted Epidaurus, and those who possessed Aegina, and Macy's, Achaean youths, their leader was then Diomede, brave in war, and Sathenelus, the dear son of much-renowned Capaneus, and with these went Eurylus the third, godlike man, the son of Mesistius, Talaus's son, and all these Diomede brave in war commanded. With these eighty dark ships followed. Those who possessed Mycenae, the well-built city, and a wealthy Corinth, and well-built Cleonea, and those who inhabited Ornea, and pleasant Ereithria, and Sicyon, where Adrastus first reigned, and those who possessed Hyperessia, and lofty Gonoessa, and Pelene, and those who inhabited Aegeum, and all along the sea-coast and about spacious Helice. Of these King Agamemnon, the son of Atreus, commanded a hundred ships, and with him by far the most and bravest troops followed, and he had clothed himself in dazzling brass, exulting in his glory, that he shone conspicuous amongst all heroes, for he was the most eminent, and led by far the most numerous troops. But those who possessed great Lacedaemon, full of clefts, and Pharis, and Sparta, and Dove-abounding Messa, and Brzea, and pleasant Ogeia, and those who possessed Amicleia and Helos, a maritime city, 
and those who possessed Laz, and dwelt around Oetilus. Of these his brother Menelaus, brave in battle, commanded sixty ships, but they were armed apart from Agamemnon's forces. Amidst them he himself went, confiding in his valour, inciting them to war, but especially he desired in his soul to avenge the remorse of Helen and her groans. Those who inhabited Pylos and pleasant Arene and Thryos, by the fords of Avoius and well-built Ape, and Cyperesius, and Amphigenia, and Plataeum, and Helos, and Dorium, and there it was the Muses, meeting the Thracian Thamyrus, as he was coming from the Oikolean Eurytus, caused him to cease his song, for he averred, boasting, that he could obtain the victory, even though the Muses themselves, the daughters of Aegis-bearing Jove, should sing. But they, enraged, made him blind, and moreover deprived him of his power of singing, and caused him to forget the minstrel art. These, the Gerenian horsemen, Nestor commanded, and with him ninety hollow ships proceeded in order. Those who possessed Arcadia, under the breezy mountain of Selene, near the tomb of Apitus, where are close-fighting heroes, those who inhabited Phineas, and sheep-abounding Orchomenus, and Strati, and wind-swept Enispe, and who possessed Tegea, and pleasant Mantinea, and those who held Stamphalus, and dwelt in Parhasi. Of these, King Agapanor, the son of Ancaeus, commanded sixty ships, but aboard each ship went many Arcadian heroes skilled in war, but the son of Atreus, Agamemnon himself, the king of heroes, gave them the well-benched ships to pass over the dark sea, since they had no care of naval works. Those who inhabited Uprasium and noble Elis, as much as Hermony and distant Mercinus, and the Olenian rock and Elysium contain within, of these the leaders were four, but ten swift ships followed each hero, and many Epeans went aboard them. Amphimachus and Thalpius, sons, the one of Cetatus, and the other of Eurytus, actor's son, commanded some. Brave Diorus, son of Emerenesius, commanded others, and godlike Polyxenus, son of Agasthenes, the son of Augeas, commanded the fourth division. Those from Dulichium and the Echinades, sacred islands which lie beyond the sea, facing Elis. Over these presided Magus, son of Phileus, equal to Mars, whom the knight Phileus, beloved by Jove, begat, who, enraged against his father, once on a time removed to Dulichium. With him forty dark ships followed. Moreover, Ulysses led the magnanimous Cephalanians, those who possessed Ithaca and leaf-quivering Neritos, and who dwelt in Croclea and rugged Agilips and those who possessed Zacynthus, and those who inhabited Samos, and those who possessed the continent and dwelt in the places lying opposite, these Ulysses commanded, equal to Jove in council, with him followed twelve red-sided ships. Thoas, son of Andreamon, led the Aetolians, those who inhabited Pluron, and Olenus, and Pylene, and maritime Chalcis, and rocky Caledon, for the sons of magnanimous Oenus were no more, nor was he himself surviving. Moreover, fair-haired Melager was dead. To him Thoas, therefore, was entrusted the chief command to rule the Aetolians, and with him forty dark ships followed. Spear-renowned Idomeneus commanded the Cretans, those who possessed Gnosis, and well-walled Gortina, and Lyctos, and Miletus, and white Lycastus, and Phaestus, and Rutium, well-inhabited cities, and others who inhabited the hundred-towned Crete, these spear-famed Idomeneus commanded, and Marianus, equal to manslaying Mars, with these followed eighty dark ships. But Telepolemus, the brave and great descendant of Hercules, led from Rhodes nine ships of the haughty Rhodians, those who inhabited Rhodes, arranged in three bands, Lindus and Iolysus and white Camerus. These spear-famed Telepolis led, he whom Astyochea brought forth to the might of Hercules, 
whom Astyochia he, Hercules, carried out of Ephri. From the river, Seleus, after having laid waste many cities of nobly descended youths, now to Lepolemus, after he had been trained up in the well-built palaces, straightway slew the beloved uncle of his father, Lysimnius, now grown old, a branch of Mars, and instantly he built a fleet, and having collected many troops, he departed, flying over the ocean, for him the sons and grandsons of the might of Hercules had threatened, and he indeed came wandering to Rhodes, suffering woes, and they, divided into three parts, dwelt in tribes, and were beloved of Jove, who rules over gods and men, and on them the son of Saturn poured down immense wealth. Nireus, moreover, led three equal ships from Syme, Nireus, son of Aglaea, and King Charopus, Nireus, the fairest of men that came to Ilium, of all the other Greeks, next to the unblemished son of Peleus. But he was feeble, and few troops followed him. But those who possessed Nicerus, and Crapathus, and Cassus, and Cos, the city of Eurypolis, and the Calidne Isles, Phidippus and Antiphus, both sons of the Thessalian king, the sons of Hercules commanded, thirty hollow ships of these went in order. But now, O muse, recount those, as many as inhabited Pelasgian Argos, both those who dwelt in Alos and Alope, and Trechin, and those who possessed Phthia and Hellas, famous for fair dames, but they are called Myrmidons and Hellenes and Achaeans, of fifty ships of these was Achilles chief, but they remembered not dire-sounding war, for there was no one who might lead them to their ranks, for swift-footed Achilles lay at the ships, enraged on account of the fair-haired maids, Briseis, whom he carried away from Lyrnessus, after having suffered many labours, and having laid waste Lyrnessus, and the walls of Thebes, and he killed Minetes, and spear-killed, Epistrophus, sons of King Evanus, the son of Selepius. On her account he lay grieving, but speedily was he about to be roused. Those who possessed Phlysa and flowery Pyrhasus, the consecrated ground of Cyrus, and Eton, the mother of sheep, Maritime Antron, and Grassi Ptelon, these warlike Protesilaus, whilst he lived, commanded, but him the black earth then possessed. His wife, lacerated all around, had been left at Phlysi, and his palace half finished, for a Trojan man slew him as he leapt ashore from his ship much the first of the Greeks. Nor were they, however, without a leader, although they longed for their own leader, for gallant Podarces marshalled them, Podarces, son of sheep abounding Iphiclus, the son of Philasus, own brother of magnanimous Protesilaus, younger by birth, but the warlike hero Protesilaus was older and braver. His troops wanted not a leader, but lamented him, being brave. With him forty dark ships followed. Those who inhabited Phaer by the lake Hoibis, Hoibi, and Glephrea, and well-built Iolcus, these Eumelus, the beloved son of Admetus, commanded in eleven ships, whom Alcestis, divine amongst women, most beautiful in form of the daughters of Peleus, brought forth by Admetus. Those who inhabited Methoni and Thaumacia, and possessed Meliboea and rugged Olizon, these Philoctetes, well skilled in archery, commanded in seven ships. Fifty sailors, well skilled in archery, went on board each to fight valiantly, but he lay in an island enduring bitter pangs, in divine Lemnos, where the sons of the Greeks had left him suffering with the evil sting of a deadly serpent. There he lay grieving, but soon were the Argives at the ships destined to remember their king Philoctetes, nor were they, however, without a leader, though they longed for their own leader. But Medon, the bastard son of Oileus, whom Rhina brought forth by city-wasting Oileus, marshalled them. Those who possessed Thrica and Hili Ithomi, and those who possessed Oikileia, 
the city of the Oikilean Eurytus, Podalarius and Machaon, two excellent physicians, both sons of Esculapius, led these. With them thirty hollow ships went in order. Those who possessed Ormanium and the fountain Hyperia, and those who possessed Asterium and the white tops of Titanus, these Eurypylus, the brave son of Avaemon, commanded, with him forty dark ships followed those who possessed argissa and inhabited gertone and orthe and elone and the white city olusan these the stout warrior polypoetus son of perithus whom immortal jove begat commanded him renowned hippodamia brought forth by perithus on the day when he took vengeance on the shaggy centaurs and drove them from mount pelion and chased them to the Ithacians. He was not the only leader. With him commanded warlike Leontius, son of Magnanimous Coronus, the son of Coenius. With these forty dark ships followed. But Gyneus led two and twenty ships from Cyprus. Him the Aeneanus followed, and the Perebi, stout warriors, who placed their habitations by chilly Dodona, and those who tilled the fields about delightful Titerisius, which pours its fair flowing stream into the Peneus, nor is it mingled with silver-eddied Peneus, but flows on the surface of it like oil. For it is a streamlet of the Stygian wave, the dreadful pledge of oath. Prothos, son of Tenthredon, commanded the Magnetes, who dwell about the Peneus and leaf-quivering Pelion. These swift Prothous led, and with him forty dark ships followed. These then were the leaders and chieftains of the Greeks. Do thou then, O Muse, tell me who was the most excellent of these, of the kings and their steeds, who followed the son of Atreus to Troy? The steeds of the descendant of Ferris were indeed by far the most excellent, which Emulus drove, swift as birds, like in hair, like in age, and level in height of back by the plumb-line. These, bearing with them the terror of mars both mares silver boat apollo fed in pieria of the heroes telamonian ajax was by far the best whilst achilles continued wrathful for he was by far the bravest and the steeds which bore the irreproachable son of peleus surpassed those of emulus but he on his part lay in his dark sea traversing ships breathing wrath against the son of atreus agamemnon the shepherd of the people but his forces meantime amused themselves with quoits and javelins, hurling them and with their bows, and their steeds stood, each near his chariot, feeding on lotus and lake-fed parsley, and the well-fastened chariots lay in the tents of their lords, but they, longing for their warlike chief, wandered hither and thither through the camp, and did not fight. But they went along as if the whole earth was being fed upon by fire, and the earth groaned beneath as in honour of thunder rejoicing jove when angry when he strikes the earth around typhoeus and Aramea, where they say is the tomb of typhoeus thus indeed beneath their feet the earth groaned mightily as they went and very swift they passed over the plain but swift-footed iris came from aegis bearing jove a messenger to the trojans with a woeful announcement they all collected together both young and old were holding councils at the gates of Priam, but swift-footed Iris standing near accosted them, and she likened herself in voice to Polites, son of Priam, who, trusting to the swiftness of his feet, sat at watch for the Trojans on the top of the tomb of old Isaetus, watching when the Greeks should set forth from the ships. To him, having likened herself, swift-footed Iris addressed them, "'Old man, ever are injudicious words pleasing to thee, as formerly in time of peace, but now has an inevitable war arisen. Truly I have already very often been present at the conflicts of heroes, but never have I beheld such brave and numerous forces. For very like unto the leaves or the sand proceed they through the plain, about to fight for the city. Hector, for it is to thee, in particular I give advice, and do thou act thus. For many are the allies through the great city of Priam, and different are the languages of the widely spread men let then each hero command those of whom he is the chief but do thou marshalling the citizens be leader of them thus she said but hector was not ignorant of the voice of the goddess 
and he instantly dismissed the council, and they rushed to arms, and the portals were opened, and the troops rushed out, both foot and horse, and much tumult arose. Now there is a certain lofty mound before the city, far in the plain, that may be run round, which men indeed call Batia, but the immortals, the tomb of nimbly springing Marina, there the Trojans and their allies were then marshalled separately. The Trojans, in the first place, great helmet-nodding Hector, son of Priam, commanded. With him far the most numerous and the bravest troops were armed, ardent with their spears. The Dardanians, in the next place, Aenus, the gallant son of Anchises, commanded him to the Anchises the divine goddess Venus bore, couched with him a mortal on the tops of Ida. Not alone, but with him the two sons of Antenor, Archilochus and Achamus, skilled in every kind of fight. But the Trojans who inhabited Zelea, beneath the lowest foot of Ida, wealthy and drinking the dark water of Asipus, these Pandarus, the valiant son of Lycaon, commanded, to whom even Apollo himself gave his bow. Those who possessed Andrestae, and the city of Apestus, and possessed Pythia, and the lofty mountain Tircia, these Andrastus and linen-mailed Amphius commanded, the two sons of Percosian Merops, who was skilled in prophecy above all others, nor was he willing to suffer his sons to go into the man-destroying fight, but they did not obey him, for the fates of sable death impelled them. Those who dwelt around Percoti and Procteus, and possessed Cestus and Abidus and divine Arisbe, these Asius, son of Hyrtacus, prince of heroes, commanded, Asius, son of Hyrtacus, whom large and fiery steeds bore from Arisbe, from the river Sileus. Hippothous led the tribes of the spear-skilled Pelasgians of those who inhabited fertile Larissa, Hippothous and Peleus of the line of Mars, the two sons of Pelasgian Lethus, son of Teutamus, commanded these. But Acamus and the hero Peros led the Thracians, all that the rapidly flowing Hellespont confines within. Ephemus, son of the heaven-descended Trozenus, son of Seas, was commander of the warlike Sisones. But Pyrechmes led the Paeonians, who used darts fastened by a thong, far from Amadon, from wide-flowing Axius, from Axius, whose stream is diffused the fairest over the earth. But the sturdy heart of Palaemones from the Aneti, whence is the race of wild mules, led the Paphlagonians, those who possessed Cytorus, and dwelt around Sesimus, and inhabited the famous dwellings around the river Parthenius, and Cromna, Aegialus, and the lofty Erythini hills. But Hodius and Epistrophus, far from Alibi, whence is a rich product of silver, commanded the Helizonians. Chromus and the Augur Enomus commanded the Mycenaeans, but he avoided not sable death through his skill in augury, for he was laid low by the hands of Achilles in the river, where he made havoc of the other Trojans also. Phorcys and godlike Ascanius, far from the Ascania, led the Phrygians, and they eagerly desired to engage in battle. But Mesthales and Antiphus led the Maeonians, both sons of Telemenaeus, whom the lake Gygea bore. These led the Maeonians, born beneath Mount Timolus. Nastes commanded the barbarous-voiced Carians, who possessed Miletus, and the leaf-topped mountain of Perthiri, and the streams of Meander, and the lofty tops of Mycali. These, indeed, Amphimachus and Nastes commanded. Nastes and Mamphimachus, the famous sons of Nomion, who foolish, went to battle decked with gold like a young girl, nor did this by any means ward off bitter death, but he was laid low by the hands of the swift-footed son of Achus at the river, and warlike Achilles took away the gold. But Sarpedon and gallant Glaucus from Lycia afar, from the eddying Xanthus, led the Lycians. End of Book the Second Read by Stephen Carney